Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 646. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's February 16th, 2021. All right, welcome to another show. I'm making sure I turn the AC off because I don't want to be loud in here. And here's the problem. I know the rest of the country is just freezing cold and there's snow everywhere. Somehow I found myself in, in the middle of Florida where it's still stinking, you know, 80 degrees. So we're running the AC. I guess it's only going to be 70 today, but uh, um, I'm glad I haven't lost my power. How's George doing? You're like an hour north of here and you got your, your Florida sweater on. It must be freezing up there. Yeah, it's. I know it's in the low 70s, Kevin. It's freezing here. Um <laughs> I uh, had to take my parka off uh, uh, to film. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful day. The sun's out. It's cool. It's in the high 60s, low 70s. That's not and true. I'm very cold. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> uh, it, now, I'm here in an RV park in, in the middle of Florida, and everybody outside is walking in, in what I call George wear. They have their parkas and their winter coats, even though it's in the 70s, and it's kind of cute to watch. One guy with probably the whitest legs, you know he's from up in the north, Wisconsin or something, was walking. He was walking in Kevin wear with the shirts and the short, short sleeves. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a mixed state community I'm in. Well, uh, Kevin, wait yeah. till August when it's 95 degrees, 100% humidity. And you'll see George happy, alive, vibrant, you know, enjoying living in a steam bath. And Kevin will be no, dying. I will be dying. Well, actually, he'll be gone. <laughs> I will. I, I th I'm thinking Montana, maybe Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. We don't know where we're going. Uh, we, we keep having discussions about where to go next, and they they kind of uh, the discussions end with us falling asleep because we have not decided what state to hit next. I think we're going to go back to Connecticut for a month or two, then maybe Pittsburgh, then maybe Wisconsin. But uh, it's all up in the air. Um, that's the kind of lifestyle we lead right now. With COVID, I um, thought we'd talk about a lot of stuff. There's not a lot of church news to talk about uh, in the forefront of today's show, but there's a lot of canceled going on. And I thought George and I could certainly talk about that because this cancel culture is taking out not just the, the very uh, loud conservatives, it's taking out middle management conservatives, those with, who are just raise their voice a little bit and say, I don't think you should cancel. <laughs> you know, maybe we shouldn't cancel, you know. And so um, it's hitting mild Disney characters. It's hitting the liberal secular host of The Bachelor who just said, hey, maybe we shouldn't be so uh, quick to cancel everybody. Cancel. And I thought you and I could talk about that because it's going to affect Christians, not just conservatives. It's going to affect uh, evangelical, Roman Catholic. Uh, the ecumenical world is going to be canceled because now that the seculars can see that they can do it and the pagans can get away with that without uh, a whole lot of scuffle, they're going to continue. Why stop now? Why don't we just take care of this Christian's uh, scourge once and for all? Let's just get rid of the, the whole kit and caboodle, make them second-class citizens, and boom, we're off to the races. And well, this is a great topic to talk about, George. It's a frightening topic, but it's ultimately a satisfying topic because we know Jesus Christ is Lord. And we don't have to have any fears or doubts or worries about what we should do. We know what the truth is. And... In the Episcopal Church, there's a culture that has been there ever since I joined the ranks of the clergy 25 plus years ago. Um, I was I received a call to the parish of a diocese of Newark when I was a young, very young priest, and I was told I couldn't come by John Shelby Spong, which I'm sort of glad because uh, I like the South. It's too cold up north. <laughs> But it's nothing new in the Episcopal world, it's just the secular world is catching up. And one of the things I've found in my life in the Episcopal world is that if you go along and get along, you lose, I think you lose your, I don't want to say soul, but you lose your self-worth, self-esteem. 
I think if you, lose, you are I, quiet you, when you need to speak out, you lose your spark. You know that about yourself. Yeah, you lose your spark. I, yeah, I don't want to say people lose their soul, but um, they lose their reason, and that's that's hard to to see people like that who are uh, enthusiastic about uh, Christ, are eager to talk about Christ, um, but that that moment in time when they're faced with a situation where they can be bold as scripture calls us to be or step back you see that uh, our friends in the our viewers in the australian state of victoria which is melbourne and that part of the country i've been writing about this new law that criminalizes attempts to pray for people in conversion therapy to change person's sexual orientation now, in the United States, we've had various municipalities and states try to pass legislation saying you cannot counsel someone how to come out of the gay lifestyle. And that's been defeated by the federal courts, which says that's a free speech right. You, can, you cannot be compelled to be silent on that issue by the state. Well, Australia and England and, other, and Canada, certainly, don't have those protections. And I'm hearing from clergy in Victoria, the Melbourne area, who are saying, at what point am I ready to go to jail when, if we're praying for a young man or a young woman who is struggling with their sexual identity, who seeks to leave a destructive lifestyle? In other words, it's not, I remember in 98 at the Lambeth Conference, uh, Emmanuel Chuck Wuma, who was the, uh, who's now the Archbishop of, uh, that part of Nigeria that we used to call Biafra, mm -hmm. tried to cast out the demon of homosexuality from Richard Kirker, the head of the gay and lesbian Christian movement. And standing next to me was Colin Coward, another leading gay activist, and Stephen Bates of The Guardian. And we're watching uh, this uh, you know, Nigerian bishop trying to cast out, I cast out the devil of homosexuality, you fag! And... Uh, <laughs> It didn't take. It didn't take. Uh, and, you know, at that time, it was sort of a chuckle for, for, the, for the activists that this man would be so silly as to try something. Today in Australia, that's a crime. Um, well, that's and the other not, thing is, Kirker well, didn't want to change. Yeah, well. And <laughs> we're talking about people who want to have help in changing their sexual orientation. Well, you're also talking about a, you know a different a person who wants to be counseled. You know, counseling works fine. Um, is different than a person who's being, you know, almost spiritually molested by, you know, a, a person trying to do an exorcism. Uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's much different uh, in that. And there's so many wonderful testimonies of people who have taken time and said, you know, I don't want to struggle with this anymore. They do get counseling. And some are able to uh, change. Some are able to better work with the uh, same-sex uh, uh, feelings they have. And some just walk away and said, you know, I thought I'd try it. It didn't work. The, you know, the, there's examples and testimonies of all three. If there are some who are successful, you then have to say, well, it can't be against the law if those who desire to change are having some success. You, you can't make that against the law. Or is that the problem? Is the problem that there is success, and therefore you need to, to make it le illegal? That's very much part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I think it's the change in our, in our worldview that puts the tribe ahead of the individual. In other words, the tribal value of uh, uh, same-sex attraction is more important than an individual's view of that in their own life. Mm -hmm. So... It used to do whatever is right for you, whatever floats your boat, man. In other words, the sort of 60s worldview, the Frank Sinatra, I gotta be me, I gotta be free, I gotta do it my way. Worldview is gone. And the new worldview is you do it our way, and your way doesn't matter. And we're, we're, Linda Nichols, the primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, signed a document encouraging Canada to criminalize uh, conversion therapy. Um, it's just, I think, frightening because 
Now, let's step back one second from the actual issue of the efficacy of psychocounseling. Correct. Uh, psychocounseling. Uh, I know, yeah. Um, my daughters, two of my daughters, have both been anorexic at certain points in their lives, where they profoundly believe that by their weight, that they were grossly obese. And both of them had to have counseling, and thank God they've come out of that. And it's, but you don't just stop being anorexic. It's a five, ten-year process. And they're about five, six, seven years into the process. But they eventually wanted to be freed from this worldview that all women all had to look like Twiggy and be sticks. And that degree of personal autonomy that would say you have to conform to the worldview of Cosmo magazine or these teen models and you cannot be yourself is so destructive for little girls, for example. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, and that's the biggest problem we have now with social media and the internet generation and the millennial generation is everything is for a picture. Everything is for a selfie. Everything is for how you look and how you look online and how your friends think you look. Never has body um, imagery and this desire to look better and the depression for not looking up to snuff been so destructive to a generation. Uh, the, the selfie generation is slowly killing itself because they can't live up to one another's expectations. And it's so hard to watch this destruction. And they do need psychotherapy. And this, this also idea of autonomy, of God made us as individuals, and we have personal relationships with the Lord. We don't, yes, we're part of a Christian community. We're part of, part of the communion of saints. Yes, yes, yes. But at the same time, you stand alone before the Lord when you're judged for your sins. Your priest, your mother, whoever it is, can't intercede for you, nor can your group identity for, for you. And this is what drives my personal uh, op opposition to such modern theories as critical race theory. I do not deny that there is terrible racism in the world. I do not deny that people are cruel and evil and mean, and they shouldn't be. What I deny is that all whites, all blacks, all Asians, all this, all that, are guilty for the actions of others, and that we all have the same world way of looking and seeing things. Mm -hmm. I know black racists. I, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I shared with the story of Robert Mugabe. Uh, where I've been in Africa and I've met men who came through the liberation struggles in, Zimb in Zimbabwe or who came out of the Mau Mau era in Kenya who have profound hatred of white European colonialists. Um, that was their life experience. I, well, I'll tell you a little anecdote. When I was uh, a brand new, when I first was in Florida, this is year 1999, 2000, I invited a, uh, a bishop from Burundi who was touring the country to raise money for his diocese um, to come to preach in my parish. And my junior ward was a man in his late 80s from South Georgia, from South, South, South Georgia. And we had him preach. And I was really excited because, you know, I was in my 30s and I was a brand new parish. And we were, and we were a small parish and sort of the countryside. And... Here I had been able to snag a visiting bishop. And after the service uh, was over, the uh, junior warden came up to me while we was in the, I was in the checkout line, you know, when you stand outside and hold, shake hands. And he said, George, that was really, I don't want to see a colored man here in the pulpit again. This is 2000. Yes. This is the United States. Mm -hmm. And I sort of smiled and did the little pull him along <laughs> with my hand, grab his hand, shake it, and pull him, and think that, oh, God, what a jackass. Um, now, I don't want to go into the pastoral reasons, but that, but that man in his life had animosity towards African Americans. It was cultural. It was life experience. It was still wrong, mm -hmm. and part of my work to him was to bring him out of that and to seeing all men as creatures of God. 
But, you know, I've seen white racism. I've seen black racism. Now, when we turn on social media, we see white self-hatred and black rage and white rage and black self-hatred. It's just has nothing to do with the say For those who know Christ, this is all a waste of time. And that's why I get so agitated when the church diverts its true responsibilities and mission to going down this dead end. Right, but this is just the way that the seculars and the pagans react to what they see. When somebody gets shot, it's not the shooter, it's the gun. When there's evil in the world, it's not the evil, it's the white people. You know, we're, 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 we, we never identify the enmity that, is, that it is. We always look for something else to blame. And that's, this is, you know, critical race theory is gun control on steroids. You know, it's, it's looking at the wrong problem uh, in order to, for a solution. I like to watch a, a minister on the Facebook on social media named Vodi Balk. Um, he's an African American preacher, and he really speaks strongly on this issue from the position of telling the African American Christian community, "Don't be suckered by these lies of Satan, of all whites are bad, all blacks are good, racial solidarity trumps everything." Christian solidarity trumps everything. He doesn't hold back from the racists. He doesn't mm -hmm. hold back from the bigots and the people who seek to treat others, you know, for their skin color. But at the same time, he's, he's a, it's a marvelous preacher who really speaks to the, I know people get up tired when I say this, but the Marxist uh, basis for all of this modern nonsense that well, we're seeing spouted. As long as you're mentioning Vodi, we do need to pray for Vodi. He has been diagnosed with heart failure. Uh, mm -hmm. They flew him back from uh, Africa this week. He landed here in Tampa. He's now in Fort Worth getting treatment. Uh, in 2021, heart failure is not a death sentence. It's it's very treatable, uh, but do keep him in your prayers. He is a extraordinary preacher, uh, great theologian, and a person who is very impassioned. He's not impassioned about his health. Now he's going to be impassioned about his health. God has got his attention. Thank God for that. Um, one thing we always forget, and as a lover of history, let me tell you that every nation and every race in the history of Earth has, at one time or another, enslaved another race or another nation. It was only the Western nations and Western culture that figured out it was bad. Slavery still occurs in nations in Africa, Asia, um, and around the world. Here in the West, Europe and America, we said, ooh, this is bad. Somehow we figured out it's bad to enslave people. We haven't figured out yet it's bad to kill the unborn. I'm hoping we'll, we'll, we'll finally get that under our belts, but we have figured out slavery is bad. We have learned from it. We have to learn into it. We have to look at our history, embrace it, and never repeat it. If you try to erase this history, erase our history of racism, erase our history of slavery, you will repeat it. Oh, wholeheartedly repeat it. The, and the, the impetus for to getting rid of slavery came out of the evangelical Christian movement in England and the United States and other parts of, of the Protestant world. Uh, William Wilberforce, most notably, getting Britain single-handedly he single handedly yeah, said, stop. Uh, changed the worldview of England to say that, you know, these are human beings. Um, the abolitionists in the United States, at the same time, were working towards understanding and treating uh, the, the slave as a brother in Christ. And when we talk about the Civil War, here I am, living in the Deep South most of my adult life, but I am the child of Yankees. Uh, my ancestors all fought in the Union Army. In fact, Colonel Everton Conger 
was the man who captured John Wilkes Booth. You can look no, it up. It's I did not know that. That's cool. Yes. And so I have a really wonderful pedigree on that score because I've got dead ancestors from Pennsylvania, New York, and New England who all died in service of the Union cause. And a number of them, including the ones from Pennsylvania, had been Quakers, but they joined the army and became Episcopalians <laughs> so that they could put an end to a monstrous evil that would only destroy America. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think you reach those points in your life when you have to. Being a Pennsylvania, Philadelphia Quaker, if you will, was a comfortable, prosperous living. You didn't, uh, you know, you had your own community, you had, you, you were exempt from the military. In other words, it was, you were a, a member of a social, certain stratum of society. But then to chuck that off because you believe in something which is the equality of all people, such that you're willing to fight for it, enlist in the army, and go and serve, um, takes a tremendous thing. And so that when we have these people who march for life in Washington, D.C., in the frozen winter, I am filled with admiration for them because it is such a socially unpopular position to take. Uh, we mentioned at the start of this show, um, I like this show, Dirty Jobs, starring Mike Rowe. It's off sure. the air. He's had a number of other jobs. He narrates the uh, Alaskan fishing show, which I love to watch, mm -hmm. Dangerous Catch. Uh, he did. I think that show has also ended. But he had a show on Facebook that he had four or five million viewers. And Facebook canceled his show. And... It wasn't that they thought he was a stinker. And they could have always replaced him. It was one of the best shows. But they canceled his show because Mike Rowe's show was promoting hard work, delayed gratification, the nobility of working with your hands. In other words, you don't have to go to college to be a full human being. But if you have a trade, if you have a skill, if you do something that promotes the common good in your labors, that's a wonderful thing. But you have to work hard, have a good attitude. And Mike Rowe's show was canceled by the Facebook executives because he was privileging white nationalism. Hard work, perseverance, a positive work attitude, a positive work ethic, what we used to call the Protestant work ethic, got Mike Rowe canceled from Facebook. Yeah, uh, Kevin Sorbo, Hercules, uh, got canceled. I mean, it, it it's crazy to see what's going on in, in you know, mentioned before the cancel culture. Um, we should hit some other news. We're already, well, almost a half hour in, George. Um, more news from Burma. Burma has gone dark. So the same people, when we say go dark, uh, the, the internet's been shut off, not by the government this time, the internet has been shut off by Facebook and Twitter and social media, who's you know agreeing to the the coup leaders who says, listen, if you want to have a future in this country with your platform and you want to advertise to the Burmese people, you need to listen to us now because we are the future. Cut off services this instant. Facebook, oh, well, of course, we're here to help. Oh. <laughs> If, can we be honest? We supported you guys the whole time. We were always for this military coup, just so you know. And Twitter was the same way. Social media goes where the money is. We always wonder why Tesla and Facebook and Twitter are doing so well in China, uh, a very uh, horrid communist country, because they know that they have access to the 7 billion uh, population of China with their advertising dollar. Now, there's money there. I, we're not going to stop advertising in China. Oh, and by the way, China, we support you. We support your government. Don't, don't think we don't because you're where the money is. There's only like 379 million Americans. The money is with the billions of Chinese. The Tesla money in selling cars is with the billions of Chinese. That's the future. They won. China has won. 
the uh, horror, well, it, in Myanmar, the, the details are, um, when democracy returned to Myanmar a few, about five, six, seven years ago, the government permitted a other internet company, ISPs, to start up. So there's the, always been the state monopoly, but then foreign companies, a Norwegian company, a Qatari company, and a company owned by a Vietnamese uh, firm set up ISP, ISP uh, in Myanmar. And this past week, uh, the government turned off by basically flicking off the switch, uh, the ISPs, and when the coup took place, then they turned it back on. And then we started seeing these Facebook uh, streams of the protests in the streets. And at the point that the army brought out, it, and we could watch photos of uh, trucks with fire hoses clearing crowds from the street. Then the next day, the army brought out the armored personnel carriers and tanks. And around the giant pagoda in central Rangoon and in the capitals. And then the internet was went dark again. But this time the government didn't pull the switch. It said to these foreign ISPs, would you please discontinue service? It said to the fo social media companies, our local laws uh, don't permit you to broadcast uh, civil insurrection and criminal acts. You cannot promote, you cannot show a criminal act. Um, and the overseas foreign ISPs and the social media companies said, well, you know, we have to follow local law. So part of the part of the fun thing that I find hysterically, well, not hysterically, but sadly amusing, is the social giants in this country strove to uh, bring down a government while in Myanmar, they're happy to uh, support a military di dictatorship. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, they're actually taking on the side of the insurrection, which I thought a month ago was bad. But, <laughs> and, and the thing in China is that there's now no doubt that what the CCP government, Chinese Communist Party government, is doing to the Uyghurs, the Muslims in Western uh, China, in Xinjiang, um, is a genocide that is approaching the level of uh, the Nazi Holocaust. Now, they don't have death camps and extermination centers, but they're doing forced sterilizations. They're doing, uh, they're, they're- uh, Slave labor. They're forced slave to, labor. Yeah. Um, the million, uh, I don't know how many, because the, the numbers are always all over the place, but it's between 800,000 800, and a million is the, our best estimate. Our satellite pictures show the camps, you know. And, and this country allows sneakers to, that are made in these slave labor camps mm -hmm. to be uh, sold in this country. Uh, the Walt Disney Company uh, made a new uh, live action, live, not an animated, but a live mm -hmm. movie. The live Mulan. action of Mulan, yeah. Yeah, and it was filmed with the assistance of the Chinese government in this part of the world. Just think of it, look at it this way. Let's say in the 1940s, we had uh, Gone with the Wind filmed in Poland, right next to Auschwitz, with the assistance of the German government. Um, if the, with an American company doing the financing, you know, doing the, the product. So the Chinese government, uh, it, the Walt Disney Corporation is happy to work hand in glove with a murderous regime, but it will cancel a girl, a woman who uh, tweets, who's one of the stars of one of their cable shows, uh, Mandalorian, I think it's Something called. Like that, yeah. I've never seen it myself. I haven't watched it. Uh, because she tweets about the necessity for free speech and standing up for the oppressed. So it's okay for Disney to work with actual killers and murderers, but it is, but Disney will not tolerate people speaking up who are actors or actresses. I mean, it's like the NBA. The NBA is 
the woke, most woke of the professional sports leagues. Uh, there, and yet they will, you know, what was LeBron James has, you know, been so pro-Chinese that uh, it's, it's yeah. shameful. It's <laughs> shameful that money buys these American companies. Um, a, a person from a race known for being enslaved is supporting a country who enslaves. The, the irony will never cease in some of these things we have to report in history. One of the people, we, we read the comments all the time. One person says, why don't you guys report on some good news? And sometimes reporting on bad news is actually reporting on future good news. And our next story is that. Um, thanks to the Biden administration, and we saw this a little bit in the Obama administration, persecution of Christians is cool again. It, it's um, going to happen around the world. The Biden administration told which uh, Nigeria, some African nation, listen, if you guys don't change your LGBTQ plus 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 laws, uh, we're going to start withholding money. When's the last time we heard that? We heard that from Obama when he flew to Kenya. You guys are being uh, a, a little hard on, on this community by having laws that forbid it. We're going to we're going to stop the American spigot. And so that's policies continuing now, again, under the Biden administration. Uh, and we're going to see places that persecute Christians no longer be the target of America, but be in partnership with America. Uh, the, Niger the Nigerian yeah. situation is doubly distressing to me because they are not demanding that northern Nigeria eliminate the Sharia laws. Mm -hmm. Northern Nigeria is governed by Muslim law so that homosexuality is punishable by death. Um, they're going after Nigerian civil law in the Christian South, saying that in the Christian South you must adopt pro LGBTQ RSTUV plus 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 X Y and Z laws no. but they're saying nothing about the north and what will this will do will basically further divide a splintering federal republic of Nigeria just when they need help uh, in overcoming these tensions that could break that country apart into politically warring factions um, we may see another Biafra war, which in the 60s was a, a war that saw mm -hmm. millions die of starvation when the Igbo people in the southeast tried to form their own republic. Um, and the, the signs are there uh, for a collapse. Um, but, but Kevin, you just said some stories are good. How... how, how could this possibly be a good story? Because persecution and a common enemy are the Spock. Spock. Oh my gosh, I'm doing all Star Trek. Are the spark that ecumenicalism needs to start to see the unity in each other again and to start to work together again. We are a point in this world where the church, all it has left is each other. All denominate nations have left right now are each other. The world is finally fully against you. The Roman Catholics, all you have are the Lutherans, the Methodists, um, and all the other denominations. The Lutherans, all you got now are the Roman Catholics, the Methodists, the Anglicans. And you, you guys got to learn to work together now. You're forced to play nice. You're no longer going to be divided by your, your strange doctrines. You need to find what works together because the world is fully against you regardless of your denomination. And this is the spark that ecumenicalism, long word, big word, needed. And it's here. And it's called persecution. And it's, it's Christians have historically been so good at forming circular firing squads and killing their own wounded mm -hmm. so that our fights over transubstantiation or over uh, baptismal regeneration or Marian doctrine tear us apart when we have a common enemy seeking to destroy all Christians. 
I'm not minimizing the importance of particular denominational creeds or uh, beliefs. But rather, what I'm saying is that they need to stand uh, to one side while we are in the midst of a war to destroy the Christian faith, mm -hmm. which I feel is being pushed upon us by the world. Yeah, so the good news, Kevin, is you're absolutely right. There's, my sense is that there's a spiritual linking, a prayer world, a prayer movement, a spiritual movement that is uniting everybody from the assemblies of God to the Orthodox across the spectrum into a common call for the power of the Holy Spirit to form us together to be one in Christ so that we can stand against the evil of this world. Yeah. And that certainly is wonderful news. It is, because most denominations now are at their lowest point. You, you, you've lost people for generations fighting mm -hmm. uh, cultural battles, losing cultural battles, embracing the culture as a battle. And now is your point. You get to s stand up and say, I have more in common with the Roman Catholics than I do with the pagans in culture. I have more in common with the Methodists. I have more in common with the Lutherans. I certainly have more in common with the Anglicans. And some of my proudest moments as an Anglican were watching Archbishop um, Robert Duncan and Metropolitan Jonah uh, you know, try to reach an accord and, and embrace a way forward for those denominations to have St. Vladimir's and Neshota House sign an accord that you know we're, we're going to find a way forward in this. To see um, the and the Church of North America reach out to the Roman Catholic Church and say, we need to find a way forward. To have the Lutheran, Anglican uh, Church of North America associations going on at Trinity and around the nation. This is the time that those um, moments of unity need to really be solidified because we're only going to go forward together in this. We can't at all... Uh, be fretting over our doctrines. We need to be fretting over Christ. And this is, this is that chance. This is the good news of persecution. Persecution will have no good end if we can't be unified. And as Anglicans, we need, I think, to bury our pride and our snobbery and our bigotry and look at our Methodist brothers and our Baptist brothers as not, well, they're, you know, little, they're, they're not the true yeah. church, <laughs> but look at them as fellow laborers in the same vineyard. Mm -hmm. And the Catholics need to do that towards the Anglicans, and the Orthodox need to do that to the Catholics. To withdraw, to step, I'm not saying forget, but I'm saying step around the historical memories that have led that saw these divisions form. Um, see, it's, see, as an Episcopalian, uh, I'll tell you a dirty little secret. Uh, Episcopalian, we view anybody who speaks English who's not a Roman Catholic is a natural Episcopalian. They just don't know it. They don't know it. <laughs> and, you know, somehow or another, they got caught up in these groups like Methodists and Presbyterians. But, you know, when they, when they settle down in life, they'll naturally become Episcopalian. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's the mindset of the Episcopal world and its, well, its older clergy. Yeah. And if we can sort of put that to one side, that it's more important to staggle up a few Baptists and show them off as converts, but rather to work with the Baptists and the Catholics on life issues, on, on the helping the, the oppressed in China and Sudan, helping country, restoring race relations to what they could be. This is where denominations have to call each other and say, how can we help? Hmm. Hebrews, New Testament, all scripture says, gather together and encourage one another. This is it. This is that time. This is when we as a body of believers gather together and encourage one another. We call each other and we say, how can we help? And, you know, I hope I get reports in the next uh, coming years that, you know, we finally decide to work together. 
Uh, I grew up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s where in small town Midwest, the Roman Catholics and the uh, Lutherans never talked to each other at the leadership level. You know, you, you went to the Roman Catholic Church and you were those people. You went to a Protestant church, you were those people. The Baptists never talked to the Lutherans, the Lutherans never talked to the Roman Catholics. That was Verona, Wisconsin. And if you wanted to join the country club, you became an Episcopalian. Right, if you wanted to be the, the, the golf club, you were the Episcopalian. Those days are over. No more division will serve in the days of persecution. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 646 of Anglican unscripted.